On behalf of the Socratic Club, I would like to welcome you to tonight's debate. I would like to ask you all to please respect our speakers and your fellow audience members by abstaining from conversation to the, to, during the debate. Also, please turn off your cell phones at this time. I would also ask that nobody distribute flyers or solicit audience members at tonight's Socratic debate. This is neither the time nor the place for that. The Socratic Club was founded by C.S. Lewis in 1941 at Oxford University to explore the intersections of Christianity, contemporary society, and culture. We continue this tradition in honor of his commitment to the frank and open discussion of beliefs. The OSU Socratic Club is a completely student-led organization which raises funds, advertises, organizes, and hosts debates throughout the school year. We are currently looking for passionate and dedicated students to help organize events like tonight's. We need student leaders to help organize debates for next year. If you are interested in joining the Socratic Club, please see our table in the back. For tonight's debate, we will feature a new speaking format. There are four rounds of speaking in which each speaker may present his argument and offer rebuttals to his opponent. <clears throat> the first round lasts 20 minutes, the second round 12 minutes, the third round 8 minutes, and the fourth round 5 minutes. The four rounds of speaking are then followed up by a question and answer period with the audience. Tonight's debate will focus on the existence of God. Is God the greatest fact or the greatest illusion? Of all the questions posed by philosophy, this is surely the most important. Has scientific knowledge made belief in God unnecessary and outdated? Is the universe all there is and God merely a human invention and a fantasy? Was there an uncreated being who is absolute, perfect, eternal, and personal that we call God? If there is no God, man has the potential to free himself from an illusion that no longer casts its transcendental spell. But if God exists, humans can find meaning and purpose in life and a secure foundation for ethical behavior. These issues will be addressed by the two distinguished philosophers who will offer widely diverging points of view. Let me say no more than to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker tonight is William Lane Craig. Dr. Craig is Research Professor of Philosophy at Biola University in La Mirada, California. He is known for his contributions to the philosophy of religion, philosophical theology, and historical Jesus studies. He holds a PhD in philosophy from the University of Birmingham in the UK, where he studied, studied under the British philosopher John Hick. He also has a doctorate in theology from the University of Munich, where he studied under the German theologian Wolfhart Penninger. He has authored or edited more than 30 books and has engaged many prominent academic atheists in public dialogue and debate. Please join me in welcoming William Lane Craig. Thank you and good evening. I want to begin by thanking the Socratic Club for inviting me to participate in tonight's debate. And it's also great to see Vic Stenger again. Dr. Stenger and I had a debate on this topic several years ago, and so I know we're in for a good discussion this evening. Now, the question before us tonight is, does God exist? I'll leave it up to Vic to present the evidence against God's existence. In my opening speech, I want to sketch briefly six reasons that weigh in favor of God's existence. As a professional philosopher, I'm convinced that God makes sense of a vast range of the data of human experience, including philosophical, scientific, moral, historical, and existential considerations. Number one, then, the ontological argument. I've never shared this argument in a public debate before, uh, not because I think it's unsound, but because it's so abstract that students are either apt not to understand it or else to think it's some kind of a trick. But tonight I'm going to take a chance and share it with you. Now in order to understand this argument, you need to understand what philosophers mean by a possible world. A possible world is just a way the world might have been. 
It's a complete description of reality. The actual world is the description that is true. Other possible worlds are descriptions that are not in fact true, but might have been true. To say that something exists in some possible world is just to say there's some description of reality which includes that entity. To say that something exists in every possible world means that no matter which description of reality is true, the entity will be included in that description. Now, with that in mind, consider the ontological argument which was discovered by Anselm of Canterbury. God, Anselm observes, is the greatest being conceivable. If you could conceive of anything greater than God, then that would be God. Thus, God is the greatest conceivable being, a maximally great being. So, what would such a being be like? Well, he would be all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, and he would exist in every logically possible world. A being which lacked any of those properties would not be maximally great. We could conceive of something greater. But what that implies is that if God's existence is even possible, then God must exist. For if a maximally great being exists in some possible world, he exists in all of them. That's part of what it means to be maximally great, to be all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good in every logically possible world. So, if God's existence is even possible, then he exists in every logically possible world, and therefore in the actual world. We can summarize this argument as follows. Premise one, it's possible that a maximally great being, God, exists. Two, if it's possible that a maximally great being exi exists, then a maximally great being exists in some possible world. Three, if a maximally great being exists in some possible world, then it exists in every possible world. Four, if a maximally great being exists in every possible world, then it exists in the actual world. Five, therefore a maximally great being exists in the actual world. Six, therefore a maximally great being exists. Seven, therefore God exists. Now, it might surprise you to learn that steps two through seven of this argument are relatively uncontroversial. Most philosophers would agree that if God's existence is even possible, then he must exist. So the whole question is, is God's existence possible? Well, what do you think? The atheist has to maintain that it's impossible that God exists. He has to say that the concept of God is incoherent, like the concept of a married bachelor or a round square. But the problem is that the concept of God just doesn't appear to be incoherent in that way. The idea of a being which is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good in every logically possible world seems perfectly coherent. So I'll just leave it to you. Do you think, as I do, that it's possible that God exists? Well, if so, then it follows logically that God does exist. Argument number two, the argument from contingency. The deepest question of philosophy is why does anything at all exist? Experience teaches that, number one, everything that exists has an explanation of its existence either in its own nature or in an external cause. You see, anything that exists is one of either two types. The first type is something that exists necessarily by its own nature. Examples? Well, many mathematicians believe numbers and other abstract objects exist in this way. If such entities exist, they just exist necessarily without any cause of their being. The other type is anything that has an external cause of its existence. Examples? Mountains, planets, galaxies, people. They have causes outside themselves which explain why they exist. 
Now, it's obvious that two, the universe exists, whereby the universe, I mean all of space-time reality, not just our observable portion of it. It therefore follows that the universe has an explanation of its existence. But what sort of explanation is it? Well, it seems plausible that three, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is an external, transcendent, personal cause. Why? Because the cause must be greater than the universe. Think of the universe, all of space and time. So the cause of the universe must be beyond space and time. Therefore, it cannot be physical or material. Now, there are only two kinds of things that fit that description either an abstract object, like a number, or else an unembodied mind or consciousness. But abstract objects don't stand in causal relationships. The number seven, for example, can't cause anything. It therefore follows that four, the explanation of the universe is an external, transcendent, personal cause, which is what everyone means by God. Number three, the cosmological argument. In one of the most startling developments of modern science, we now have pretty strong evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning about 14 billion years ago in a cataclysmic event known as the Big Bang. What makes the Big Bang so startling is that it represents the origin of the universe from literally nothing. For all matter and energy, even physical space and time themselves, came into being at the Big Bang. As the physicist PCW Davies explains, the coming into being of the universe, as discussed in modern science, is not just a matter of imposing some sort of organization upon a previous incoherent state, but literally the coming into being of all physical things from nothing. That description holds not only for the standard Big Bang model, but also for quantum gravity models, like that of the famous physicist Stephen Hawking. And thus Hawking reports in his book, The Nature of Space and Time, and I quote, Almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. But then the inevitable question arises, why? Why did the universe come into being 14 billion years ago? What brought the universe into existence? Well, unless you're willing to say that the universe just popped into being uncaused out of absolutely nothing, there must be a transcendent cause beyond space and time which created the universe. And thus, from premise one, everything that begins to exist has a cause, and two, the universe began to exist, it follows logically that three, therefore, the universe has a cause. Now, as the cause of space and time, this cause must be a timeless, spaceless, immaterial being of unfathomable power. Therefore, it must also be personal as well. For the only thing that could fit that description, as we've seen, is an unembodied mind. And thus, we're brought not merely to a transcendent cause of the universe, but to its personal creator. Number four, the moral argument. If God does not exist, then objective moral values exist. By objective moral values, I mean moral values which are valid and binding whether anybody believes in them or not. And the claim is that in the absence of God, moral values would not be objective in this sense. So, premise one, if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Many theists and atheists alike agree with this premise. 
For example, Michael Roos, who's a noted philosopher of science, explains the position of the modern evolutionist is that morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think they are referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. On a naturalistic view, moral values are just the byproduct of biological evolution and social conditioning. Just as a troop of baboons exhibit cooperative and even self-sacrificial behavior, because natural selection has determined it to be advantageous in the struggle for survival, so their primate cousins, Homo sapiens, have evolved a similar behavior for the same reason. As a result of socio-biological pressures, there has evolved among Homo sapiens a sort of herd morality, which functions well in the perpetuation of our species. But on the atheistic view, there doesn't seem to be anything about this morality that makes it objectively true. And here I think Dr. Stenger seems to agree. He writes, for example, we may call animal morality instinctive, built into the genes of animals by biological evolution. When we include cultural evolution as well, we have a plausible mechanism for the development of human morality by Darwinian selection. On this view, certain actions like rape or incest are not biologically or socially advantageous, and so in the course of human development have become taboo. But that does absolutely nothing to show that rape and incest are really morally wrong. Such behavior goes on all the time in the animal kingdom. The rapist who goes against the herd morality is doing nothing more serious than acting unfashionably, like the man who belches loudly at the dinner table. On a naturalistic view, it's hard to see any reason to think that human morality would be objectively true. But the problem is that premise two, objective moral values do exist. In moral experience, we apprehend a realm of objective moral values that impose themselves upon us. There's no more reason to deny the objective morality or objective, uh, objective reality of moral values than the objective reality of the physical world. Actions like rape, cruelty, and child abuse aren't just socially unacceptable behavior. They're moral abominations. Michael Roos himself admits, and I quote, the man who says it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. Some things are really wrong. Similarly, love, equality, and self-sacrifice are really good. But then it follows logically and inescapably that three, therefore, God exists. Number five, the resurrection of Jesus. Historians have reached something of a consensus that Jesus of Nazareth came on the scene with an unheard of authority, the authority to stand and speak in the place of God himself. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come, and as visible demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracles and exorcisms. But the supreme confirmation of his claim was his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, then it would seem that we have a divine miracle on our hands, and thus evidence for the existence of God. Now, most people would probably say that the resurrection of Jesus is something you just believe in by faith, or not. But there are actually three established facts which are recognized today by the majority of New Testament historians, which I believe are best explained by the resurrection of Jesus. Fact number one, 
On the Sunday following his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. According to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist, by far most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. Fact number two, on separate occasions, different individuals and groups saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to the prominent New Testament critic Gerald Ludemann, it may be taken as historically certain that the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. These appearances were witnessed not only by believers, but also by unbelievers, skeptics, and even enemies. Fact number three. The original disciples suddenly came to believe that God had raised Jesus from the dead despite every predisposition to the contrary. Jews had no belief in a defeated and dying Messiah, and Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead to glory and immortality before the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples came to believe so strongly that God had raised Jesus from the dead that they were willing to die for the truth of that belief. N.T. Wright, an eminent British scholar, concludes, that is why, as a historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. Attempts to explain away these three great facts, like the disciples stole the body or Jesus wasn't really dead, have been universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. The simple fact is that there just is no plausible naturalistic explanation of these facts. And therefore, it seems to me, the Christian is amply justified in believing that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. And thus, we have a good inductive argument for the resurrection of Jesus. And I'll ask the technician to simply bring up these premises one at a time quickly now. I'm not going to have time to read them because I'm short on time. Number six is that you can experience God personally. This isn't really an argument for God's existence, rather it's the claim that you can know that God exists wholly apart from arguments simply by personally experiencing Him. This was the way people in the Bible knew God. As Professor John Hick explains, God was known to them as a dynamic will interacting with their own wills, a sheer given reality as inescapably to be reckoned with as destructive storm and life-giving sunshine. To them, God was not an idea adopted by the mind, but an experienced reality which gave significance to their lives. Now, if this is the case, we mustn't so concentrate on the external proofs that we fail to hear the inner voice of God speaking to our own hearts. So, in conclusion, then, we've seen six reasons to think that God exists. If Dr. Stenger wants us to believe atheism instead, then he must first tear down all six of the arguments that I've presented, and then in their place build a case of his own for why he thinks atheism is true. Unless and until he does that, I think we should conclude that theism is the more plausible worldview. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Before I go on, I want to remind those people in the back that um, <clears throat> there are a few seats up front, and don't forget there are seats up on top. <clears throat> Our next speaker tonight is Vic Stenger. Vic Stenger received a PhD in physics from UCLA in 1963. <clears throat> he then took a position on the faculty of the University of Hawaii Retiring to Colorado in 2000. His current position is adjunct professor of philosophy at the University of Colorado and emeritus professor of physics at the University of Hawaii. Dr. Stenger has also, visit, has also held visiting positions on the faculties of the University of Heidelberg in Germany, Oxford in England, and the University of Florence in Italy. He also has been a visiting researcher at Rutherford Laboratory in England and the National Nuclear Physics Laboratory in Frascati, England. Excuse me, Frascati, Italy. Dr. Stenger's research career spanned the period of great progress in elementary particle physics that ultimately led to the current standard model. 
He participated in experiments that helped establish the properties of strange particles, quarks, gluons, and neutrinos. He also helped pioneer the emerging fields of very high energy gamma ray and neutrino astronomy. In his last project before retiring, Dr. Stanger collaborated on the underground experiment in Japan that showed for the first time that the neutrino has mass. The project leader received the Nobel Prize in 2002 for his work. Vic Stanger has had a parallel career as an author of nine critically acclaimed popular level books that interface between physics and cosmology and philosophy, religion, and pseudoscience. His 2007 book, God, the Failed Hypothesis, How Science Shows That God Does Not Exist, was a New York Times bestseller. His last two books, which came out in 2009, are Quantum Gods and The New Atheism, Taking a Stand for Reason, Science and Reason. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stanger. Well, thanks so much. What a pleasure to be here and to uh, get a chance again to show you why William Lane Craig, uh, as brilliant as he is, is wrong. <laughs> uh, he, uh, I will get to those six points during my, my rebuttal. I will use my uh, opening statement to make my own position clear. Now, you often hear it said that science is unable to prove or disprove the existence of God. I will argue that science has in fact now reached a point where it can say with confidence beyond a reasonable doubt that God, the God with the attributes of the Judeo-Christian Islamic God does not exist. Surely Dr. Craig will agree that there's no scientific evidence for God. If there were, it would be the textbooks along with the evidence for quarks and DNA. I claim that this absence of evidence is evidence of absence because it is evidence that should be there. Science deals with observations. The God of Abraham, Jesus, and Muhammad plays such an active role in the universe that his actions should surely have been observed by now. He is supposed to be responsible for everything that happens in the universe, from every atomic transition in the farthest galaxy to every leaf falling to the uh, ground here on Earth. He listens to every human thought and acts on those thoughts. Let me list the places where the actions of God should have been observed with sufficient likelihood to make the fact that they have not been observed positive evidence that God does not exist. Number one, God is supposed to talk to people. This is something that can be easily tested. Just have a person who says she talked to God provide some information that she could not possibly have known and is later objectively verified. The sacred books are supposed to be the Word of God, but they tell us the earth is flat, not an oblate spheroid, that disease is caused by sin, not germs, that knowledge comes from eating fruit from a magic tree, not science. And short, it gives us the best thinking of ancient illiterates. But we don't have to look back uh, to books thousands of years ago to seek evidence of revelation. If God talked to people, then he must talk to them now. <coughs> While many people uh, continue to claim such revelations, not one has been verified. Indeed, many such claims, such as Pat Robertson's yearly predictions, have turned out to be false. In short, the absence of evidence for revelation is evidence for the absence of God. Number two. The second area where God's actions can easily be verified is with prayer. While we can't expect, expect God to answer every prayer, with billions being submitted every day in thousands of years, you would think that by now, a few should have been led to some action that was confirmed scientifically. While some reports have appeared claiming positive effects in scientific experiments, these did not stand up to critical scrutiny. However, reputable institutions such as Harvard, Duke, the Mayo Clinic, have carried to ask whether intercessory prayer had any significant effects on health. And these are all the people who did these experiments, incidentally, were almost all believers. Uh, but they were good scientists, and they went, like all scientists must, to whatever the data says. And the data said there's no evidence that prayer has any benefit whatsoever. 
In short, the absence of evidence for the efficacy of prayer is evidence for the absence of God. Now note that these two uh, examples of God's actions could have turned out otherwise and provided real evidence for God had he existed. And let me make it clear that any scientist seeing enough evidence uh, would become a believer. It all depends on what the data say, and the data so far say God does not exist. In the past, when our knowledge was deficient, it was tempting to rely on God as a stopgap to explain all that was unexplainable. That is the God of the gaps argument, as it's called. But even in the days of Newton, scientists and philosophers have been postulating a reality without God, simply because they don't find him necessary. Three, the third area where God's absence is evident is in the lack of design in nature. Now, the argument from design was once a good argument for God. No one could imagine how the enormous complexity of life could be explained naturally until Darwin and Wallace showed how complexity follows from evolution by natural selection. Since then, every field of science, from elementary particle physics, and chemistry, to biology, to neuroscience, to the social sciences, has demonstrated the natural evolution of complexity from simplicity. This conclusion has been supported by uh, developments in computer science that demonstrate how order uh, can come out of chaos. So biological life does not look as it should look if it is the result of intelligent design. It is too imperfect, too filled with useless appendages such as junk DNA. In fact, life looks just like it should look if it is the, re the result of the unguided, cobbled together processes of evolution. In short, the absence of evidence for design in nature is evidence of the absence of God. The fourth topic is cosmology. Theology teaches that God made the universe from nothing. So no one uh, could imagine how matter in the universe, the matter of the universe, could have come from nothing without violating the laws of physics, until Einstein showed that uh, matter could come from, from energy. That's what E is equal to mc squared uh, is all. So, uh, now, uh, still no one could imagine where the energy came from, until recent decades when satellite experiments showed that the average energy density of the universe exactly equals the critical density it would have if it came from an initial state of zero energy. So no energy was required to make the universe. No miracle was required. Now, no one could imagine where the order of the universe could have come from, except from a higher order, until it was discovered that the universe is expanding, and there's always more room for order to form. In short, the absence of evidence for a creation of the universe is evidence of the absence of God. The cosmos does not look as it should if it were the work of a flawless creator. Instead, it looks just like it should look if it came from nothing, from utter and complete chaos. In fact, since we have a good reason, good reason to believe now, from cosmology, that our universe did begin in complete chaos, even if it had a creator, no trace of the creator survived that initial chaos. The only possible god is a, a deist god who created the universe, induced complete randomness, and then paid it no more attention. This is the so-called God who plays dice. You can pray to him or her or it if you want, but it won't do much good because such a God does not act in the universe. Now the success of natural explanations for our basic observations not only show that God is not necessary to understand life in the cosmos, they contradict the whole concept of a creator God who acts in the world. They allow us to conclude beyond a reasonable doubt that God, such a God, does not exist. Let me now present the latest scientific views on the nature of the universe without God. And this please understand that I'm not introducing any new physics of my own or anyone else's. I'm simply giving a philosophical interpretation to our current best understanding in physics and cosmology. Since the 1980s, reputable cosmologists have published papers in reputable scientific journals proposing scenarios by which the universe could have come about naturally. One plausible mechanism is a well-established process called quantum tunneling. Our universe could have tunneled from a prior state of complete chaos 
and possibly through that region of chaos from an earlier universe. In my 2006 book, The Comprehensible Cosmos, you'll find this scenario worked out completely mathematically from well-known principles of physics and cosmology. That proof is accessible to anyone who has studied undergraduate math and physics. Again, this is not my uh, personal invention, but taken from peer-reviewed literature. While we cannot prove that the universe came about in this exact manner, the fact that such a scenario can be fully formulated, consistent with all we know about physics and cosmology, shows that we are not required to introduce God or any other supernatural element to explain the existence of the universe. Now, at this point I'm often asked, what about the laws of physics? Where do they come from? Well, the laws of physics are not what most people think they are. They are not rules for the behavior of matter, handed down by God, or somehow built into the structure of the universe. The laws of physics are human inventions. They are the ingredients of mathematical models that physicists use to describe observations and measurements. Now, I'm not talking postmodernism here. Uh, the laws are not arbitrary. Uh, they're not different in every culture. They must agree with observations. But they're still our inventions. In the 20th century, physics, physicists discovered that virtually all the laws of physics follow from one simple rule. Any mathematical model you write down to describe some observation cannot depend on the point of view of the observer. The model must contain certain symmetries so that no particular observer is singled out as special. Revision is made that for these symmetries to be spontaneously, that is, accidentally broken. In 1916, mathematician Emmy Noether proved that the most important laws of physics, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, and conservation of angular momentum, appear automatically in any model that does not depend on any special time, any special position, or any special direction. We require that our models must be the same now as they were 13 billion years ago and will be the same 13 billion years in the future. We require that they must be the same inside the nucleus of an atom here on Earth as they are 13 billion light years away in an atom in a distant galaxy. We require that they are the same in Moscow as they are in Melbourne, where the directions to find is up are different. When we extend this principle to four-dimensional space-time, we find that Einstein's special theory of relativity completely follows from just requiring no special direction in space-time. The general theory of relativity is also based on space-time symmetries. Now, early in the 20th century, physicists extended these ideas to the abstract space that they used to describe the quantum states of the system. They called this principle gauge symmetry. From gauge symmetry, they were able to derive all of the, uh, base, the basic structure of what is called, they, they were able to derive uh, the, uh, the basic ideas of electromagnetism. In fact, the whole, all the equations of electromagnetism could be calculated, could be derived from just that principle. By 1970, they had developed the basic uh, structure of what is called the standard model of particles and forces. In that model, all the matter that composes the stars and planets in the visible universe is composed of just three fundamental particles, the electron and two kinds of quarks we call up and down. Since then, the standard model has successfully described all observations made of accelerators and telescopes. The standard model provides us with the basic physics of the universe back to when it was a trillionth of a second old. So we know a lot about the universe at this stage in our history. Now that the Large Hadron Collider has gone into operation in, in Geneva, we may, we may soon hear of the first violations of the standard model in four decades. At least that's what we physicists hope. Physics has been stalled by the lack of empirical anomalies to guide us uh, to up to the next level of understanding. It's really not no fun knowing everything there is to know. At this point, the stubborn theist might still ask, where is all this symmetry? The answer is simple, it came from nothing. I equate nothing to the total chaos that we project existed just before the Big Bang. If something has no structure to define it, it is as much nothing as nothing can be. 
If our universe came from nothing, as the model suggests, and you tried to describe that nothing in terms of space and time, you would have complete symmetry. So the symmetries of the universe are just what they should be, if they came from nothing. It follows that the laws of physics are just what they should be if they came from nothing. And that means the laws of physics are just what they should be if there is no God. One more final point on cosmology. I am often asked, why is there something rather than nothing? I usually retort, uh, why isn't there uh, why isn't there uh, nothing uh, rather than something? Why is nothing so uh, special? Excuse me, just a second. I was too busy making notes to get my, my pages in order here. As the uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist Frank Wilczek has said, in, 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 answering, in trying to answer the question, why is there something rather than nothing? He says, he said that nothing is unstable. In physics, the natural direction of phase transitions is from simplicity to complexity, from symmetry to less symmetry. For example, in the absence of heat, water vapor will spontaneously change into liquid water and then into solid ice. The structure of ice is more complex than that of water vapor. Consider the beauty of a snowflake, which comes directly from water vapor. The universe is like a snowflake. It's frozen nothing. Moving from physics to neuroscience, I want to explain why we can now make a convincing case against the common belief that the human mind is associated with an immaterial, immortal soul. If consciousness is to continue after death, then how can we become unconscious by brain injury, chemicals, illness, or anesthesia, which are purely material in nature? Brain scans of incredible precision uh, now enable neuroscientists to identify patterns of neuronal firing that constitute our thoughts and emotions. Models for how the brain produces consciousness are now sufficiently developed that they are beginning to be tested in the laboratory. So nothing in the world of, of science requires us to introduce God or the supernatural to explain anything that we observe in the universe. Science has adequate models to at least plausibly, uh, to provide at least plausible natural explanations for fundamental questions such as the origin of the universe, the origin of complexity, the apparent fine-tuning of the parameters of physics, uh, the production of complexity from simplicity, and the nature of consciousness. Now it is true that God could deliberately hide from us, or if he wanted to, that by not making his presence known to all but a select few, like evangelical <laughs> Christians, that that would be an evil God, an immoral God. The God who dooms everyone but his favorites to everlasting torment. A good God, a moral God would not do that, He'd make himself available to everybody. So the very fact that there are non-believers in the world proves that God does not exist. Summarizing, the Judeo-Christian Islamic God can be scientifically shown not to exist beyond a reasonable doubt by by the absence of evidence that should be there. There should be evidence that he reveals truths to humans. There is none. There should be evidence that he answers prayers. There is none. There should be evidence for design in nature. There is none. There should be evidence of a miraculous creation. There is none. Thanks very much. Shouldn't the 12th card be up for this speech? Yeah, okay, very good. Well, thank you, Vic, for those very interesting comments.
You remember I said in my opening speech I would uh, present my six arguments for God's existence. In this speech, I want to respond to uh, Dr. Stinger's arguments against God's existence. Now, his fundamental argument was that if God existed, then God's existence should be detectable in some way, but it's not, and therefore God does not exist. Now, how does this argument go? What are the premises of this argument? Well, in his book, uh, on page 22, he lays out the argument more rigorously. It goes like this. Premise one, probably, if God were to exist, then there would be good objective evidence for his existence. Two, but there is no good objective evidence for his existence. Three, therefore, probably, God does not exist. Now, this is a logically valid argument, so the only question is, are those two premises true? Well, let's look at them. What about the first one? Probably, if God were to exist, there would be good objective evidence of his existence. I'm not confident that that premise is true. I can think of at least two reasons why God might not provide such evidence. Number one, he might provide a way of knowing that he exists apart from evidence. For example, he might build into us a cognitive faculty that uh, innately ex uh, apprehends his existence. Or he might testify to our spirits through his spirit, drawing people to a knowledge of himself. These sorts of inner ways of knowing God would have the advantage of not being dependent upon a person's personal circumstances, like his literacy or access to libraries and so forth. And this isn't just a speculation, this in fact represents the theory of knowledge or epistemology of one of the most eminent uh, Christian philosophers today, Alvin Plantinga, who does maintain that God has created us in such a way that we can know that God exists, wholly apart from evidence, through the cognitive faculties that God has imbued into us. But another way in which this premise might not be true is that God could provide such evidence selectively only to persons who he knew would respond to it if they were to receive it, but not to persons who he knew would not freely respond to it. Now, Vic Stinger said in his last speech, but such a God would be immoral, he would be evil to provide evidence only selectively. Not at all. God is under no obligation to provide evidence to persons who he knew would reject it even if they had it. So long as God provides evidence to anyone who he knew would freely respond to it if they received it, God could do it in that way. So I'm not at all confident that that first premise of Vic Stenger's argument is true. It seems to me to be very dubious. But, but let that pass. Suppose that if God existed, he would give objective evidence for his existence. He needn't do it in the ways that Dr. Stenger has stipulated. For example, imparting supernatural knowledge or prayers for healing or things of that sort. He could, for example, raise Jesus from the dead miraculously. Or he could create a universe with a beginning. Or he could plant his moral law on the hearts of all men. In other words, he could do exactly what he has done. On pages 231 to 33 of his book, Dr. Stinger lists 11 observations which, if observed, would confirm the existence of God. And I was uh, amused when I read these because I think that at least seven out of the 11 are in fact observed. So I think we do have good evidence for the God hypothesis. So, the first premise of his argument, I think, is uh, not proven to be true. The second premise is outright false, and therefore it is not a sound argument. Now, let me look specifically at the cosmological evidence for the existence of God, because this is relevant to that third argument I gave, the cosmological argument. You remember that argument goes like this. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Dr. Stinger disputes this by saying, no, the average density of the universe is zero, and therefore it doesn't need to have a cause. Well, now, frankly, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think this rejection is something of a bad joke. The idea here is that the positive energy associated with matter might be exactly counterbalanced by the negative energy associated with gravitation. So, on balance, there is zero energy, 
And the inference then is drawn, therefore no cause of the universe is needed. Now this is like saying if you go on a round trip journey and retrace your outbound trip exactly to come back to the place you started, then your net motion is zero. And therefore there needn't be any cause of your journey. Or if your assets and your debits are exactly counterbalanced, your net worth is zero, and therefore there's no cause of your financial situation, which would be obviously absurd. Christopher Isham, who is Great Britain's leading quantum cosmologist, points out that there still needs to be what he calls ontic seeding, that is to say, a cause to create the positive and negative energy in the first place. Now, what is the source or the cause of that positive and negative energy? It's the quantum vacuum. And the quantum vacuum is emphatically not nothing. It is a roiling sea of energy governed by physical laws and having a physical structure. And that leads to the question, can that quantum vacuum be eternal in the past? And the answer to that question is no. You see, uh, quantum physics predicts that at every point in the quantum vacuum, a fluctuation would occur, which would grow into a universe. So that if the vacuum has existed from eternity past, for infinite time, universes would have formed at every point in the quantum vacuum, and by now have coalesced into one infinitely old universe, which contradicts observation. Therefore, Christopher Isham says, these models were not widely accepted. He said, in fact, this uh, difficulty proved fairly lethal to these vacuum fluctuation models. And as a result, he said, they were jettisoned 20 years ago, and nothing much has been done with them since. Now, Dr. Stenger says, but uh, the vacuum is uh, a kind of nothingness out of which the universe might emerge. This is frankly an abuse of science. The vacuum state from which the universe is said to originate by a fluctuation is not nothing. It is a sea of energy. It is definitely not the same as non-being. And this vacuum state cannot be past eternal. In fact, in 2003, three cosmologists, Arvin Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin were able to prove that any universe which is in a state of cosmic expansion on average throughout its history cannot be eternal in the past, but must have had an absolute beginning, a past space-time boundary. The Lincoln pulls no punches. He writes in his book, Many Worlds in One, 2007, it is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men, and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, Cosmologists can no longer hide behind a past eternal universe. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. And therefore, the scenario that Vic Stenger imagines simply doesn't work. There had to be a past space-time boundary and an absolute beginning of the universe. And that, I think, points to the existence of a transcendent creator, as I have explained. So, I don't think that this first argument offered by Vic Stenger is a good one. Now, the only other argument against God that I heard in that first speech is that there cannot be any mind apart from a physical brain. But even if that were true of human beings, that's no proof that an immaterial mind, God, cannot exist. And in fact, I think we are acquainted with ourselves as immaterial persons. Reductive materialism doesn't work because mental properties are not physical properties. For example, the brain is not jubilant. The brain is not sad. These are mental properties, not physical properties. Epiphenomenalism, which is the view that says the brain has mental properties, I don't think works either because it's incompatible with self-identity over time. There is no enduring self from moment to moment on this view. It's incompatible with intentional states, with having thoughts about certain things because uh, epiphenomenal states don't think about things. It's incompatible with freedom of the will, because causation is a one-way street on this model, from the brain to the epiphenomenal states. But the epiphenomenal mental states don't influence the brain, so there's no freedom of the will on this view. So it seems to me that we have very good grounds for thinking that we are not simply material mechanisms, indeed that we are uh, substance dualists. We're, we're a kind of 
dualism, interactionism of soul and body. We act as agents in the physical world through our bodies. God is a soul without a body, an unembodied soul, who is the creator of the universe. Those are the only arguments I heard in his opening speech against the existence of uh, God, and I think neither of them is persuasive. One last point I'd like to make in my last two minutes concerns the argument from contingency. Remember that argument said everything that exists has an explanation. Uh, if the universe has an explanation, it is in a transcendent personal cause, and therefore there is a transcendent personal cause. Now, Vick says in response to this, well, why think that nothingness is the default state? Uh, why not say uh, that nothingness would need to have some explanation? Well, I think it's very easy to see why nothing wouldn't require an explanation. Because if there's nothing, then there's nothing to be explained, right? There's just nothing. Indeed, it's logically impossible for nothingness to have an explanation, because if it did, then there would be something. So nothingness doesn't require an explanation. On the other hand, if something does exist, we want to know why it exists. Does it exist through a necessity of its own nature? or does it have an external cause? And my argument is that there must be a metaphysically necessary being, which is the cause of space and time, which exists by necessity of its own nature and explains why anything else exists. So the argument requires that there be a being beyond space and time, matter and energy, and that can only be a transcendent external personal cause, a soul, as it were, without a body. So, in conclusion, then, I don't think uh, Dr. Stinger's criticisms of my arguments are sound. I don't think that the two arguments that he gave for atheism are compelling. And so, on balance, I think we still have good reasons for thinking that theism is the more plausible worldview. Well, I don't know how you could say that my, my arguments uh, against your arguments are in sound when I haven't given them yet. So let me give them. Okay, the ontological argument. I never quite understood that. Remember, I'm actually a scientist rather than a philosopher, so excuse me if I don't, don't see the, the, the logic behind that. Uh, I mean, for example, you can, you can make the statement that the uh, greatest possible pizza in the world exists, uh, uh, and so you know, therefore, therefore, there must be a greatest possible pizza. And I don't think there is a greatest possible pizza. So uh, why can't you say the same thing about God? The ontological argument uh, is a logical argument. It doesn't depend on anything that you observe, and it's something you have to understand about logic. Logic tells you nothing that you don't already know. It tells you nothing that's not already built into the premises. And so uh, you, can, you can make all the nice logical sounding arguments that you want, but they don't tell you anything that you didn't know. Uh, they just tell you that uh, something follows from uh, this or that, or the other thing follows from, from your premises. So you can't use logic alone to find anything in fact, there's only two ways that we're supposed to know, be able to find anything about reality. And that uh, one is, is supposedly revelation, but we, we, I've argued that there's no evidence for revelation. And the other is observation. And many philosophers, such as Kant and Schopenhauer, have, have pointed out that uh, we really can't know uh, from observation alone what's, what's the true reality out there. And yet observation is really all, all we have and that's what science deals with, it deals with observation. Now, uh, let me get to these, these arguments having to do with cause. Uh, Dr. Craig says everything has to have a cause. Well, that's simply wrong. In quantum mechanics, events happen without cause. The uh, uh, atoms, the uh, uh, atoms uh, radiate, the, Electrons drop from one energy level to another without cause. Nuclear decays happen without cause. And when that occurs, 
Uh, but a nuclear decay occurs, for example, consider beta decay of, of, a, of a nucleus. An electron is produced that did not previously exist, and it's produced uh, without, without any cause. Now, the cosmological argument is, is, has been Dr. Craig's uh, standby for probably 30 or 40 years now. He's that old, he not that old. I think it's been around that long. And, and it's basically that the Big Bang is evidence that the universe must have, must have had a beginning. Well, while the Big Bang marked the beginning of our universe, there could have been an, an earlier universe. As, as I mentioned in my opening statement, there are several published scenarios in peer-reviewed journals uh, by reputable cosmologists, including Stephen Hawking, that show how our universe could have come about purely naturally. Uh, these scenarios are completely consistent with all we know about physics and cosmology. And if Hawking may have once said that there had to be a beginning of time, he certainly doesn't say that now, and he hasn't said it uh, uh, for a long time. Now let me show you how that argument comes about. Almost every theist book you read these days uh, uses Dr. Craig's cosmological argument that time must have begun with the Big Bang. This is based on the notion that the universe started out as a singularity of infinitesimal size and infinite density. Here's that word infinite. So time must have itself have begun at that point. Now, was shown, this was shown to be a consequence of Einstein's general theory of relativity by Hawking and Penrose way back in 1970, 40 years ago. Hawking and others later showed that quantum mechanical effects will prevent the singularity. Einstein's theory of general relativity is not a quantum theory. I refer you to page 50 of Hawking's bestseller, which is already 22 years old now, The Brief History of Time, he jokes that he first became famous for showing there's a singularity, and then for showing there wasn't one. Uh, so, uh, the, the fact is that most cosmologists, in fact, I don't know a single working cosmologist today who believes that there was a uh, singularity prior to the Big Bang. And uh, if there wasn't a singularity, then there's no basis for arguing that time began at that point. There's no reason from cosmology that we know of that the universe can't be eternal. And incidentally, when I talk about the eternal universe, uh, I don't mean an infinite universe. The whole term infinity is a, a very uh, poorly used uh, term in, in, in science very often. Uh, uh, when I talk about the eternal universe, I, I, mean, I mean a universe that had no beginning or end, not a beginning an infinite time ago. So uh, when I talk about uh, an eternal universe, uh, say, it's just like talking about last year. A year ago, uh, it was, was uh, 365 days counted on the clock. If you count back a billion, billion years, the time between a billion, billion years and now is a billion, billion years, not infinity. So there's no argument you can give of that sort that says that the universe had to have a beginning. All right. Now, uh, one of the models that I, I mentioned that has been published is the Hartle Hawking, uh, James Hartle, Stephen Hawking model uh, called the no boundary model. And in it, the universe doesn't have a beginning. The modern cosmology suggests that a greater eternal universe exists uh, in which the Big Bang is just the origin of our particular baby universe. Now, I don't understand uh, the way Dr. Craig uh, tries to belittle all this cosmology. Cosmology now is very well established. We have wonderful data, and we can we can talk about uh, the universe uh, uh, having having no particular beginning uh, in a way that's totally consistent with everything that we know. It doesn't violate anything. And he misrepresents my argument about. Uh, uh, zero energy. I don't use the zero energy argument to say that the universe didn't have a cause. I just use the zero energy argument to show that there was no violation of energy conservation uh, from a universe coming from nothing. And now, well, uh, if he doesn't like my 
characterization of nothing as this, as this chaotic region that existed very early in our universe. Okay, I'll just call it a chaotic region uh, that existed very early in the universe. Nevertheless, that, re that uh, transition from that uh, region to the current universe is something that we can model. We have models that have been published, as I already mentioned. You find it in one of my book that I didn't invent, sort of literature, that take uh, uh, this into account, that show you exactly how the universe could have uh, tunneled from, from a previous uh, universe, for example, or just from a region of chaos. And he mentions people like Valentin. Well, Valentin is one of the people who developed <coughs> these, these models. And that paper that he mentioned by Valentin that saying that says that the universe had to have uh, a beginning uh, is counteracted by other papers. In fact, if you look at, fortunately, I didn't bring the paper with me, but if you look at the very last uh, uh, reference in that, uh, in that very, in that paper, you'll find a reference to another paper that, that gives it all the explanation. So there's really nothing in cosmology that requires that the universe, uh, that's just the opinion of, of one uh, group of people, and they haven't proven that to the satisfaction of, of everybody else in the field. Now, let me get on to some other things here. Uh, about, let's, let's get on to the moral arguments. Since subjective morals exist, Dr. Craig says God must exist. Well, here Dr. Craig uses the argument from ignorance. I can't possibly see how objective morality could come out from God without God, therefore God must exist. Now, governments pass laws all the time that are perfectly objective. So why couldn't humanity be able to produce the same thing from moral laws? Dr. Craig has too little respect for the human intellect. Objective just means that most people agree on it. It doesn't mean that it depends on a particular person. Uh, it, it means that it doesn't depend on a particular person. It, it's not independent of, of all persons. Now, I believe God to tell me that slavery and the subjugation of women is wrong and that treating every, everyone as I would want to treat myself is right. Confucius and Buddha said that 500 years before Christ. And, and furthermore, the Bible condones slavery and the subjugation of women. So the Bible is not a good source of, uh, of morality. And uh, uh, certainly atheists uh, uh, do not uh, behave any more poorly than, than theists. Uh, there are surveys that show that there's hardly any difference in the moral beliefs of atheists and uh, believers. There's a huge literature on the natural evolution of morals. And it's not just uh, necessarily from evolution. The society itself can e e evolve. And notable scholars such as Daniel Dennett, Pascal Boyer, Scott Petran have, uh, have shown that uh, there are many ways that uh, morality could evolve without God. Finally, the historical facts about Jesus and the resurrection. Uh, at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, there were many active Roman historians, including Philo of Judeus in Jerusalem. If a Palestinian rebel had been executed by Roman authorities, surely someone would have uh, noticed that. Someone would have written about it, and no one, and no one has. The historicity of the empty tomb is, is doubtful. It doesn't appear in the New Testament outside the Gospels. Paul doesn't mention it. No to biblical scholars who do not believe in the story of the empty tomb, uh, that the story is historical, include Gunther Bordkamp, Rudolf Buchmann, John Dominic Croissant, uh, Hans Kuhn, and Gerd Ludemann. In fact, I have a list of 30 published New Testament scholars who don't believe in the uh, empty tomb story. So Christianity was just one of the many cults of the Roman Empire at the time of Constantine. It only survived because the Roman Empire found it useful. When he took over the, when the Christianity took over the empire, Christians made sure that they suppressed all the other religions, destroying many temples with wonderful works of art. Uh, they were the Taliban of the <coughs> ages. Thank you.
In my rebuttal speech, I want to review those six reasons I gave for God's existence in light of Dr. Stinger's critique. First, the ontological argument. Here, Dr. Stinger responds that he's a scientist, not a philosopher, uh, and that therefore he doesn't know what to say uh, in response to this. Now, what needs to be emphasized here is that all of the arguments I've presented are philosophical arguments. Science, at best, serves as evidence for one of the premises in a philosophical argument leading to a uh, theological conclusion. So all of these arguments are philosophy, and you can't get out of uh, them simply by saying you're not a philosopher. He said, well, couldn't you have a parallel argument for the greatest possible pizza? No, because the notion of the greatest possible pizza is logically incoherent. A greatest possible pizza would be metaphysically necessary in its existence, and therefore it could not be eaten. And therefore, it couldn't be a pizza. He says, but from logic alone, you can't prove anything. Well, given that first premise, the conclusion does follow. It all depends on whether or not you think that God's existence is possible. And so it's not enough to be an atheist to say God doesn't exist. You've got to bite the bullet and say it's impossible that God exists. And I don't see any good reason to think that. The concept of God seems logically coherent but then it follows logically that God does exist. What about the contingency argument? Here, Dr. Stinger didn't respond to anything in his last speech. Remember, I showed that nothingness is not uh, the default position, that nothingness uh, couldn't have an explanation, but if something exists, then that cries out for an explanation, and there was no response from Dr. Stinger on that argument. Thirdly, the cosmological argument. The first premise, you remember, was that everything that begins to exist has a cause. And here Dr. Stenger says things in quantum mechanics can happen without a cause. Um, I'm afraid that there's no good reason to think that that is true. There's no good reason to think that an indeterministic interpretation of quantum mechanics is true. There are at least ten different interpretations of the equations of quantum mechanics, some of which are fully deterministic, and nobody knows which one is true. Dr. Stenger himself admits in his book, and I quote, other viable interpretations of quantum mechanics remain with no consensus on which, if any, is the correct one. So, he says, we have to remain open to the possibility that causes may someday be found for such phenomena. So, it's not a proven counterexample. Besides, in quantum mechanics, as I've already explained, particles don't come into being out of nothing. They come out of the quantum vacuum as fluctuations of the energy that is locked up in the vacuum, and the vacuum is not nothing. Um, Dr. Stenger in his last speech admits that if the universe does have zero energy on balance, that doesn't mean it doesn't have to have a cause. You still need a cause, and I proved then that the quantum vacuum cannot be eternal. With respect to the premise that the universe began to exist, he says, oh, but there are reputable models without a beginning. You don't need to have a singularity at the beginning of the universe, as in the hartle hawking model. My argument doesn't depend on there being a singularity. In my opening speech, you remember, I quoted from Stephen Hawking's book, The Nature of Space and Time, 1996, that's well after his hartle hawking model in 1983, in which he says that the universe uh, does have a beginning and time has a beginning. John Barrow, a British physicist, in his book, Theories of Everything, with regard to the hartle hawking model, says this type of quantum universe has not always existed. It comes into being, just as the classical cosmologies could, but it does not start at a Big Bang where physical quantities are infinite. So it still has a beginning, it just doesn't have a singular beginning. Therefore, as PCW Davies writes in his book about time, many people mistakenly suppose that Hawking has done away with the origin of the universe. This is quite wrong. In his model, time is definitely bounded in duration. So Davies concludes that recent ideas in quantum physics have changed our picture of the origin of the universe somewhat, but his universe, this is quite wrong. In his model, time is definitely bounded in duration. So Davies concludes that recent ideas in quantum physics have changed our picture of the origin of the universe somewhat, but he says the essential conclusion remains the same. Time did not exist before the Big Bang. 
Therefore, I think we do have good evidence for the origin of the universe in Big Bang cosmology. Quantum physics does nothing to subvert that conclusion. Indeed, quite the contrary, the bohr booth vilenkin theorem proves that any universe which is expanding on average throughout its history cannot be geodesically complete in the past. That is to say, it has to have a past space-time boundary. And contrary to what Dr. Stinger said, the Gordon Booth Lincoln theorem is today widely accepted in the physics community, and therefore I don't know of any more plausible model of the origin of the universe than one which says that the universe must have begun to exist. Whether the beginning was singularity or not is immaterial. The point is that it cannot be extended to the infinite past. So the cosmological argument, I think, gives powerful grounds for believing in God's existence. What about the moral argument? Now notice what Dr. Stinger did here was to redefine what is meant by objective. He says objective means most people agree with it. That's not what objective is. That's intersubjective. Uh, and I'm talking about whether or not moral values are objective in the sense that they hold and are binding regardless of whether anybody believes in them or not. And I think Dr. Stenger agrees with me that in the absence of God, moral values are not objective in that sense. And that's what the evolution of morality demonstrates and is all about. So what I want to know is why is Richard Dawkins wrong when he says that on atheism, there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pointless indifference. We are machines for propagating DNA it is every living object's sole reason for being. It seems to me that on naturalism, moral values are not objective. They are, as Dr. Stinger says, just the result of governments passing laws, social conventions. And in one nation, you can pass laws to drive on the right-hand side of the street. On another nation, you can drive on the left-hand side of the street. And neither one is objectively right or wrong. They're just social conventions. But the problem is I don't think uh, that moral values are like that. I think that rape is really wrong. I think that it really is morally wrong to rape a little child. And Dr. Stenger can't make that affirmation consistently on a naturalistic view because on a naturalistic view, moral values are just the spin-offs of biological and social evolution that have no objective validity. What about the argument for the, from the resurrection of Jesus? Here Dr. Stinger says, well, um, somebody at that time must have, would have written about Jesus if he had lived and, and died on the cross. Well, they did. Josephus, the Jewish historian, mentions him. Jesus is mentioned in Jewish, in pagan, and in Christian literature outside the New Testament. But more importantly, he is mentioned in the documents that were later collected it together into the New Testament. We have four biographies of Jesus of Nazareth. Despite his relative obscurity, we have more information about this man than we do for most major figures of antiquity. And historians have determined that among the facts that belong to the historical Jesus are things like the empty tomb, the origin of the Christian faith, and the uh, disciples' belief in his resurrection. The scholars that Dr. Stenger quoted are in the tiny minority of scholars that deny those three facts. The vast majority agree with them, and I've debated those guys that Dr. Stenger talks about, and none of their arguments have been able to hold up. So I think on the basis of the resurrection alone, we have good reasons to think that God has intervened in a public, dramatic way in human history, thereby giving us objective evidence of his existence, just that evidence that Dr. Stenger de demands that he provide. Now, in any debate, the side that has the far tougher job is the side that has the higher burden of proof. Dr. Craig knows this and is very good at trying to cast the burden on his opponents. But by any measure, Dr. Craig is the one who has the greater burden because he's the one making the more extravagant claim. I claim he can understand everything naturally in terms of matter alone. Dr. Craig proposes that a super being exists of unimagined power and goodness, and I insist that this is unnecessary uh, to understand the world. Well, I don't have to prove 
that a god was not necessary to create the universe. All I have to do is provide a plausible scenario for a natural origin that is consistent with all existing knowledge. This I have done. I do not have to prove that a god did not design the universe and life and produce the order that exists in the world. All I have to do is show that I have a plausible explanation for how complexity arises naturally from simplicity. This I have done. I do not have to prove that the universe did not have a beginning. I just have to show that we have no scientific or mathematical basis that it did. Uh, this I think they have done, even though Dr. Craig quotes some recent papers, I, I, I can tell you that uh, that's not a, a scientific cons a consensus as he, he claims it is. I do not have to prove that God did not provide us with our moral sense. I just have to show that we have no reason to assume that humanity is not capable of developing its own objective moral codes. This I think I have done. Sure, the raping uh, of a child is wrong. Raping of anyone is wrong. I know this. I didn't need God to tell me this. I don't know how it came about that I know this. Maybe it came about uh, as a, a, a natural development of the human species as we learn to, to live together. There are many, as I said, there's a whole literature uh, of, of, uh, on the subject of the evolution of morals, and it's that literature that Dr. Craig has to answer, not just, just, just my uh, weak attempts to justify the, the, the idea that we don't need God for uh, a moral, morals that we hold. Now, I don't have to prove, to prove that the events surrounding the death and supposed resurrection of Jesus, as described in the Bible, did not take place. I just have to show that this is not the consensus of many, if not the majority, of highly qualified biblical scholars. Now, Dr. Uh, Dr. Craig tells us that, again, we have a disagreement here on, on a factual matter. Uh, I don't know where he, where he, do, he does his surveys. Uh, maybe uh, he has uh, uh, some special insight here that I'm not aware of, but all. Uh, the surveys I've seen indicate that most scholars uh, do not uh, believe that the, most of the events of the gospel are, are that accurate, that they're historical. And uh, Bart Herman has, uh, has stated that, as a matter of fact. In fact, let me just quote uh, from Herman's uh, uh, debate with Dr. Craig. Uh, he said that the gospels are not historically reliable accounts. The authors were not eyewitnesses. They're Greek-speaking Christians living 35 to 65 years after the events they narrate. The accounts that they narrate are based on oral traditions that, have, uh, that were in circulation for decades before anybody started writing them down. Year after year, Christians tried, who were trying to convert others, and they told these stories to convince them that Jesus was raised from the dead. These writers are are telling stories that, that Christians have been telling all these years. Many stories were invented, and most of the stories were changed. For that reason, uh, these accounts are not useful, and we would like to, uh, uh, we, as useful as we'd like them to be for historical purposes. They're not contemporary, they're not disinterested, and they're not uh, consistent. And Dr. Craig uses the argument that, uh, of the apostles giving their lives for their their beliefs. Well, what about the Kamikaze pilots in World War II? Uh, they gave their lives for the emperor. That didn't make the emperor God. And in fact, there were a lot of German soldiers who gave their lives to Hitler, for Hitler in World War II. That didn't make Hitler God. So that's a, a pretty weak argument, it seems to me. Now, um, I don't know, I have to deny also, that many people have what they sincerely believe is, is an inner experience of God. All I have to do is argue that this inner experience can all be in their heads. Uh, the way to prove that the inner experience is legitimate and not just something in their heads would be, again, for someone to come back with some knowledge that they could not possibly have known. No one has ever done that. Just like my argument against Revelation. 
Uh, and I think those arguments that I made early in the uh, in the talk have not been rebutted satisfactorily. Those were those were factual statements. I think all of this is sufficient to defeat Dr. Craig's case. However, I've gone further. While Dr. Craig has the heavy burden of proving uh, God exists, I have accepted the somewhat lighter burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that he does not, uh, since that's really a simpler hypothesis, just taking what we see around us and saying that's all there is, and it agrees with everything we know. Uh, I've done this by instituting a criteria called that absence of evidence can be taken as the evidence of absence uh, when the evidence should be there is missing. Now, I've done this by providing several examples where evidence for God who plays an active role in the universe uh, should have been discovered by now. Now, Dr. Craig tries to, believe, to convince us that it's reasonable to believe in the Christian God. Let's see if this is in fact reasonable. This God is supposed to be the creator of the universe with 100 billion galaxies, each containing 100 billion stars. And that's just the universe visible from Earth. According to current cosmology, the largest portion of matter that appeared from the initial Big Bang now lies beyond the horizon. One estimate is that this amounts to uh, over 100 orders of magnitude more than we have uh, already within our sights. So our universe is just a grain of sand on, in the Sahara, and according to uh, current understanding, there may be an endless number of other universes, and the Christian God is supposed to rule over this while at the same time having an intimate relationship with humanity. He sent his only son, who happened to be also himself, to earth to be tortured be, because our ancestors, Adam and Eve, committed the horrible sin of eating from the tree of knowledge. For some reason, God waited nine billion years to create us and so fine-tune us so that we can expect, uh, only expect to live on this tiny planet, and, which is doomed to extinction in a billion years or so. Now, Dr. Craig calls all that reasonable. I call it preposterous. statement, I'd like to see who has discharged his burden of proof in the debate tonight, which view has been shown to be more reasonable. Has Dr. Stanger been able to show that atheism is true? I don't think he has. In his last speech, he said, I don't have to prove that there is no God. Well, no, he does have to support his premises. His argument, remember, had two premises. Probably if God were to exist, there would be good objective evidence of his existence. And I gave two reasons for thinking that premise to be dubious, neither of which he has addressed in tonight's debate. The second premise was there is no good objective evidence for his existence, and I indicated that God has provided objective evidence of his existence in things like the origin of the universe, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, God's moral law, and so forth, and Dr. Stenger hasn't dealt with those arguments specifically. Remember, seven out of the 11 observations that he lists in his book, I think, have already been met. So I don't think we've heard a very good case for the non-existence of God tonight, for atheism. What about for theism? How is the evidence shaping up there? First, the ontological argument. Dr. Stenger had no response in his last speech to my rebuttals of his uh, incoherent metaphysical pizza. Uh, the fact is that if you believe it's possible that God exists, then God does exist. So do you think it's possible that there's a God? I do, and therefore it follows God exists. Second, the contingency argument. Again, Dr. Stinger has dropped all refutation of this argument. We saw that anything that exists requires some explanation, either in the necessity of its own nature or in an external cause. And if the universe is to have an explanation, it must be in a transcendent external personal cause. Thirdly, the cosmological argument uh, for God's existence. The logical argument uh, for God's existence. Here again, Dr. Stinger simply repeated uh, his statements about the Harvard Hawking model, the vacuum fluctuations, and I showed how the vacuum cannot be extended to past eternity. 
that there it would be, uh, appear to observation to be an infinitely old universe, and he didn't respond to those points. What about the moral argument for God's existence? Here he merely affirmed that rape is wrong. But you see, he gave no explanation on how on atheism or naturalism that would be true. To assert that rape is wrong is merely to affirm my second premise that objective values do exist. The key question is, if there is no God, would there be objective moral values? And here he admits that they wouldn't because of the socio-evolutionary account that he endorses. What about the resurrection of Jesus? He said, I wonder where Dr. Craig is getting his surveys of the, of the uh, literature on this. Look, this is my area of specialization. This is where I did my doctoral work. I know the literature in this field. Indeed, I would be embarrassed if I didn't know the current state of scholarship with regard to the resurrection. Bibliographical essays have been published on things like the empty tomb, the appearances, and the origin of the Christian faith, and 75% of scholars who have written on this subject uh, accept the historicity of the empty tomb. He says, Bart Ehrman uh, says the Gospels are legendary and mythological. Bart Ehrman agrees with all three of the facts that I gave tonight. Listen to what Ehrman says in his uh, lectures from Jesus to Constantine. He says there are a couple of things that we can say for certain about Jesus after his death. We can say with relative certainty, for example, that he was buried. We also have solid traditions to indicate that women found this tomb empty three days later. This is attested in all of our gospel sources, early and late, so it appears to be a historical datum. And so I think we can say that after Jesus' death, with probably some certainty that he was buried, possibly by this fellow Joseph of Arimathea, and that three days later he appeared not to have been in the tomb. Ehrman agrees with the resurrection appearances and the origin of the Christian faith as well. His objections to the resurrection are not historical. They're philosophical. He doesn't believe in miracles. That's because he doesn't believe in God. He's an atheist. But once you think that the existence of God is possible, you've got to be open to the existence, or the possibility at least, of miracles. And I think in the case of Jesus, it does point the, the evidence in that way. Finally, what about personal experience? Well, again, Dr. Stinger really hasn't undercut this. I, God is real in my life. He's changed my life. Unless I have some good reason to think that I'm psychologically deluded, it seems to me I'm perfectly rational to believe in God. On Dr. Stinger's view, everyone who claims to have an experience of God has got to be psychologically deluded in some way, and I don't think that there's any good reason to think that. So in summary, then, I think we've got good reasons to think that God exists. We only heard, I think, weak reasons to think that God does not exist. And for that reason, I am enthusiastically a Christian theist. Okay, let me try to just make a, a quick summary of, of my arguments against what Dr. Craig has argued. As far as the ecological argument, it's, a lot, it's, it's based on logic. Logic is based on uh, the, uh, the premises that you make. It's only as good as the premises that you make. Otherwise, uh, it's of no value whatsoever in telling you anything about reality. Now, this whole business of nothing, I argued that uh, that we have very good physical reasons to understand how uh, something can come from from nothing because there's a natural tendency in the universe and all physical processes to go from the uh, more uh, complicated state, the, the more uh, the simpler state to the more complicated state, the more complex state. The natural tendency uh, of water is to move from from uh, a liquid, from a vapor to a liquid to ice, increasing its structure as you go along. This is kind of throughout of science. So the idea that the, the uh, universe could have come from nothing and, and uh, naturally developed complexity is something that's uh, well understood and can be and modeled and so on. The cosmological argument about the universe uh, uh, having, to have a, having to have a beginning, again, there are still 
scenarios out there by, by which the universe didn't have a beginning. They're all published in peer-reviewed journals, and uh, it just it cannot be proven that the universe had to have a beginning. Uh, the moral argument, uh, uh, it's, it's again just a, an assertion on his part that it has to come from God. I don't know why the moral argument can't come from, uh, why our morality can't be uh, something that we ourselves have developed over the years. Certainly it doesn't come from the Bible. The, the, uh, there isn't uh, anything in, in the uh, New Testament that has, wasn't said. Uh, uh, hundreds of years before Christ, the golden rule uh, was presented by Confucius and by uh, Buddha, and uh, Jesus himself was, was not a tremendously moral person by, by what you read in the Bible about him. Uh, I mean, for example, he, he had uh, no particular regard for the poor, he certainly supported slavery, supported the uh, subjugation of women and, and so on. So the Bible is not rare if, if people get morals from God. Uh, if the Bible is not the place where they, where they get them, then you can uh, read the Bible yourself once in a while, not just what uh, you find uh, in Sunday school classes, but, but read it uh, completely and you'll see what I'm talking about. And again, on the, the resurrection, uh, it was, it was uh, the stuff that was written about the resurrection was, was uh, years later. Uh, these claims that uh, that the, uh, the scholars uh, uh, all accept these facts is, is, is historical. Again, I have to refer to Clark Berman, who says that the majority of historians do not believe in the uh, accuracy of those initial stories. So. Uh, and again, the personal experiences. I don't deny that people have an inner experience of God. Uh, it's just whether it's, it's really uh, something supernatural or whether it's just something in their own heads. And until they come up with some kind of evidence, again, I'm a scientist, I, I need to see the evidence. I don't see any evidence uh, that uh, uh, that experience isn't just in their heads uh, and, and has nothing to do with, with anything beyond them. Let's put it on in the brain. Well, finally, suppose, let's suppose that I'm wrong. And on the day of judgment, I'm called before God to answer for myself. Here's what I plan to tell God. <laughs> How dare you ask me, God, to justify my life, you who created a world in which you've imposed great suffering <laughs> on your creatures, you who sent earthquakes and tsunamis to kill not terrorists or despots or child abusers, but instead hundreds of thousands of the poorest, most underprivileged people in the world. You kill children, thousands of children every day from hunger. You refuse to relieve the suffering of the dying. You refuse, you force animals to kill each other to survive. You didn't have to do this, God. With your unlimited power, you could have made the universe a universe with no pain or death. The universe you created was certainly big enough, vast enough, if you loved humans so much, why did you wait, uh, confine us to this tiny planet and wait nine billion years to produce us? You could have made it so we uh, could live everywhere, anywhere, even in space. All of this was, was within your control, God. You could have made a wonderful world for your creatures, but you didn't. And so it's you, God, not I, who have everything to answer for. Thank you. from the audience. We'll let our uh, speakers move over to uh, the table to my left. We ask that you write out your question ahead of time. Please ask no more than one question, clearly and swiftly, and keep it under 30 seconds, please. <clears throat> Offer no statements. Please walk down to the front of the aisle where a queue will be formed as you await your turn to ask a question. 
When you ask your question, be prepared to elaborate or repeat yourself if either speaker requests it. Once you have successfully asked your question, please return to your seat. Again, this is not a time to argue with the speakers, this is a time to ask a short question and allow them to answer. To ensure that as many people as possible can ask a question, there will be no follow-up questions or rebuttals. All questions for Dr. Craig will be asked from this microphone to your left. All questions for Dr. Steyer will be asked from this microphone to your right. I will then rotate between questions. The speaker to whom the question is directed will have three minutes to respond, then the other speaker will have one minute to respond to the same question. Our first question will be directed toward Dr. Steyer. Good evening, Dr. Steyer. My question is if you would agree with this way to resolve the apparent contradiction between your view of the scholarly consensus on Jesus' resurrection uh, with Dr. Craig's understanding. Okay? Um, your understanding, um, especially regarding uh, Dr. Berman, is that is that the majority of New Testament scholars don't see the Gospels as generally reliable. That that's a general statement about the scope of what the Gospels record. Whereas Dr. Craig is being very specific about certain facts, especially the empty tomb, the appearance stories, uh, and the origin of Christianity itself that you're making a general statement, and he is making a very specific statement where, where the, the views of various scholars have been recorded. So is that the, is that the, is that the uh, best way in your view to resolve the apparent conflict? No, I don't think I was making uh, just general statements. I was referring specifically to the, the empty tomb story uh, and uh, that uh, we don't even hear about it in, in the New Testament until 40, 50 years later uh, in, the, in the Gospels. It doesn't appear uh, in, in Paul, for example. And, and so, uh, and as far as I know, what I know from, from my own uh, reading of the scholarship, there's, uh, there's a lot of doubt out there among scholars about the, the history of it. Besides, if even if it was historical, uh, it seems to me that uh, it's still possible that there are more parsimonious explanations, like somebody <laughs> stealing the body. Dr. Craig thinks that's very unlikely, but I think uh, it, it seems to me far more likely, especially since there's no evidence uh, until years and years later what really happened, and we have contradictory stories in the Gospels that, Put them side by side, and you see that they're contradictory. So uh, I, I, uh, I maintain that, uh, the, as far as I know, the, the scholarship, the scholarship there, does not support that. It's good evidence for the existence of, of God. That's great. Well, I think you've tried to be charitable uh, to Dr. Steger and putting a, a good spin on this. Um, but the fact of the matter is he's simply mistaken about what the majority of New Testament scholars think with respect to these three facts. Remember, I quoted Barb Ehrman himself, that Ehrman accepts all three of these facts. As for people like John Dominic Crossan, Gerald Ludemann, Marcus Ford, I've debated all of these fellas, and these, t these uh, debates are available in book form as well as on DVD, and none of them challenge my statement that the, this is the majority view. You would think they would say, no, 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 that's not right. I, I represent, uh, you know, significant uh, opinion. None of them in, in our debates challenged me when I said that their view represented a minority of scholars, about 25%. Next question. First off, I want to thank you guys for uh, using logic and reason in this argument. Discussing something like this can get very... Go ahead and speak into the microphone, please. It can get very contentious, so for using logic and reason, I'm not sure I understand the question, but, but let, let me try as best I can to respond to it. I think the only 
place where you might get a difference between what and how would be with respect to the moral argument. And that is to say, my argument is that moral values are grounded in God and are therefore objective. And that's not inconsistent with saying how we discover moral values is through evolution and social conditioning and parental teaching. That would be to confuse the order of knowing with the order of being. And my argument is nothing to do with the order of knowing how we come to know these values. My argument is with the foundation of these values. What is the foundation in reality? So with respect to that argument, at least, I think that would explain perhaps a difference between us. Well, I'm not sure uh, that I disagree either, except I just don't see that uh, it, it's a convincing case for the existence of God to just say we, uh, we have good thoughts, therefore the God must exist. It seems to me we need a lot more evidence than that. And that, that moral values could very well be uh, uh, human. In fact, I'm sure they are uh, the result of our humanity. Next question. During the de this debate, uh, there has been uh, a lot of uh, repeated mention of uh, the word uh, existence uh, regarding God's existence. And this brings to my mind uh, something that uh, has bugged me uh, some time. And it's, uh, there are, uh, let's put it this way, there are uh, several names, uh, you know, uh, for, for the... I'm sure I don't understand you. There are several names for, an, uh, for a divinity, like uh, God, uh, Jehovah, um, and, and so and so. You know. What do these uh, divinities have in common? This is my, uh, uh, something that has bugged me. Uh, a, a linking uh, property uh, that, that, uh, that uh, is uh, reduced, uh, reduced them to a common factor. Uh, in my opinion, that was uh, the fact that uh, they are all representations or uh, uh, with different dressings of, of the notion of unit. And yeah, and I, I'm coming to the question. So uh, my question now is, my question is now, how do we find out whether the concept of unity is eternal or not? This is far more important than the existence of God or not. Because if the existence of unity can be proved not to be existence eternal, of existence of unity, the concept of unity, concept of unity, unity, unity. one, yeah, the concept of unity is not, is not uh, uh, eternal, then the concept of God is not eternal either. Okay, Dr. Stanger, go ahead and add some well, question. Question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry for my heavy accent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that's your question. <laughs> I, I, it's difficult to know what to say to a question like this, except I guess I would say that there's a principle in science and philosophy called Occam's razor, which says, that you should not multiply causes beyond necessity, that you're only justified in positing such causes as are necessary to explain the effect. And so I would say, in my arguments, to posit one creator and designer of the universe, one ground of moral value is sufficient, and it would be a violation of Occam's razor to postulate a plurality. And therefore, my arguments do affirm union or the unity of ultimate reality. So the okay, I'm going to respond that, uh, uh, Please have a seat, Because that's good. I'm glad you explained that. Because I think that uh, assuming no unity, no, uh, just assume that the, what we have is what we see with our eyes, the material universe, is, a, is the uh, simpler hypothesis from the standpoint of hopeless right there. That we, uh, as long as we don't need to invoke anything beyond uh, the natural world, uh, then that's the more possible is the subject. Next question. All right, uh, Dr. Craig, when you say that without objective moral values, things like child rape and incest, incest would not actually be wrong, 
and then you go on to use that as evidence for why objective moral values do exist. How does this not fall into a fallacy of consequences insofar as the truth of your premise no. lies now, in our if, if I understand your question correctly, the fallacy called affirming the consequent is the fallacy that says P implies Q, Q therefore P, and that's the fallacy of affirming the consequent. But my argument doesn't go like this. My argument follows the valid inference form. P implies Q, not Q, therefore not P. And that's valid. The, the reason it might be confusing is because there are already negations in the original premise. If God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Objective values do exist. That is to say, it is not the case that objective values do not exist. Therefore, it is not the case that God does not exist. That's equal to saying God does exist. So the, neg the extra negatives in there might make it a little confusing, but it is a valid argument uh, based on that inference form. P implies Q, not Q, therefore not P. It doesn't affirm the consequent. Well, again, sure, the logic is there. It's indisputable. It's the premises that uh, are disputable. And this, the idea that uh, you can't have Objective moral values uh, without God is 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 the one I was speaking of. He it whatsoever, but we can't have objective moral values without God. Next question, uh, Dr. Stinger. I had a question for you uh, earlier on in your arguments, and then um, just now during these questions, you mentioned that you've seen no biblical record outside of the Gospels of the empty tomb. Um, and I seem to find just one such record in the book of Acts, chapter 13, where the Apostle Paul, in Antioch, in a synagogue of Jews, defends the empty tomb without a rebuttal. Did you consider that possibility at all? I didn't, uh, did you read me the quotation that you read? Uh, yes. So, uh, I'll break into his speech here, but in verse 28 of chapter thir 13 it says, Paul speaking to the Jews, um, and though they found no guilt in him, Jesus, worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But three days later, God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came up from him, with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. And this is Paul speaking. Right. Right. He doesn't say anything about the empty tomb. He just says that Jesus was resurrected. So the empty tomb is not, is, is not a... Well. <laughs> After he was laid in the tomb, he broke. He was resurrected. But the, 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 this, the, the argument is over whether there is some observation uh, of, of the tomb uh, being empty that people uh, uh, refer to. And he just, <coughs> It was, it was some kind of witnesses, in other words, to the empty tomb. All he says is it was resurrected. They, they, they could have been a, a totally uh, abstract God that was resurrected as far as that's concerned. There's nothing factual involved. I'm assuming I can't speak further, right? You yeah, asked your question. I think the question is absolutely correct that you also have references to the empty tomb in the sermons that are preserved in the book of Acts. Another one that you didn't mention is in Acts chapter 2, where Peter contrasts Jesus' tomb with David's tomb, King David. And he says, David's tomb is with us to this day. But this Jesus, God raised up. And clearly the uh, opposition of the comparison there is between Jesus' tomb and David's tomb. And the one is empty, the other is not. So you're quite right in seeing sources for the empty tomb in these sermons and the Acts. And what's significant about this is that many scholars think that what Luke preserves in Acts is not his own creation, but rather primitive oral tradition of the earliest preaching of the apostles. So that this goes right back to the earliest sources, the earliest eyewitness sources, with respect to Jesus. Uh, so this is extremely early and important evidence that we have preserved in the book of Acts. Next question. Dr. Craig, you've argued that time began with the start of the universe, that 
the universe and time began together. You've also argued that the universe has to have a cause. I have always been puzzled by this. I think that the cause and effect are a function of time. And if you do not have time, you do not need a cause that the effect is sufficient. Um, the argument of cause and effect does not make sense to me in a timeless state. So I ask you to explain that. Oh. I addressed this question recently on my website, uh, reasonablefaith.org. Every week I take a different question from readers. And about two or three weeks ago, I took the question about whether or not causation requires the existence of time. And I don't see any good reason to think that uh, causation does require the existence of time. Think of it this way, cause and effect can surely be simultaneous. Think of a heavy chandelier hanging from a chain from the ceiling. Clearly, it is the ceiling that is supporting the chandelier. It's not the chandelier that is pushing up the ceiling. The, the causal arrow there goes from the chandelier as the effect to the ceiling and the chain as the cause. And yet these are simultaneous, at least on the macroscopic level. So it seems to me that God's creating the universe could be simultaneous with the origin of the universe. Indeed, what could be more natural than that? The moment at which God creates the universe is the moment at which it begins. So I see the act of creation and the coming into being of the universe as both taking place simultaneously at the first moment of time. So I would say that beyond the Big Bang, God existing alone is timeless. But that with his causal act of creating the universe, time comes into existence, and he exists at that moment of time, too. He becomes temporal. So that would be my view, and I've never seen any reason to think that that's logically incoherent or impossible. Thank you, Well, time is a human invention. Dr. Craig is assuming there's something in reality called time. Time for And it's, it appears in physics uh, models that we built to describe observations. So the, 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 that whole discussion, that whole description that he's talking about there is gibberish because it's based on a, an undefined concept of time. Dr. Stanger, please move your microphone down on your shirt so it won't scratch and make popping sounds, please. I think you said your mic is rubbing against your beard and it's making some <laughs> finger. <laughs> so I need to move it down. Next question. Yeah, there you go. There you go. I guess, first of all, I just feel privileged to have heard this debate. Um, thanks to everyone. Um, and, and Dr. Singer, um, I, uh, I hope that so you hear my question in the sense that much of your speech, speeches were that is this possible, as, as you were asking a lot of times. Um, so I ask, actually in reference to your, your last statement um, in, in your speech, um, is it possible that our original and continual evil actions and choices have caused a general state of evil, and God's part in causing evil was merely to allow us the choice? Well, I can't, I can't tell you what God's intentions are, but he sure made it a miserable world. And, and uh, I don't know how you can reconcile this miserable world and all the suffering that exists with, with the God that's supposed to be good. I think an evil God is perfectly possible. And that's the, in fact, that's the only God that I think is, is reasonable in the light of, of the world as it exists. Well, I wish Dr. Stinger had brought this up earlier in the debate instead of in his closing statement, because it certainly is, I think, the most important argument out there for atheism, all the suffering and uh, pain in the world. It used to be widely believed by philosophers, uh, at least atheistic philosophers, that the existence of God and the evil in the world were logically incompatible with each other, that no possible world contained God and evil. This view now has been pretty much given up among philosophers because it lays a burden of proof on the atheist that is simply too heavy for him to sustain. He would have to show that it is logically impossible for God to have morally sufficient reasons for permitting the suffering in the world. And that's just pure speculation. No one lays a burden of proof on the atheist that is simply too heavy 
for him to sustain. He would have to show that it is logically impossible for God to have morally sufficient reasons for permitting the suffering in the world. And that's just pure speculation. No one has ever been able to show that that's logically impossible. So the real debate today concerning the problem of evil is whether or not the suffering in the world makes it improbable that God exists. And here all kinds of moves can be made, uh, I think, to suggest that if the Christian God exists, it's not at all improbable that we should find the world suffused with both natural suffering and, and moral evil. So that the evil and suffering of the world, I think, does not render improbable the existence of the Christian God. Now, I can't say very much about that this evening, but I've written on this in my published work, for example, in the book Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview, as a lengthy chapter on this problem that I would uh, commend anybody who's struggling with this important objection. Dr. Stanger, would you like to respond? Well, I thought... Well, excuse me. Yeah, I, I was going to respond. Excuse me, sorry. <laughs> Next question. Um, Dr. Craig. Next question is for um, you. My question kind of... We've been talking about all tonight about maybe this omnipresent God, you know, the soul versus, you know, kind of a figure of what is right and what is wrong. But my question kind of takes a little bit from, I'm going to steer away from Christianity for a second, kind of go for more of a scientific slash Buddhism type of, you know, feel to it. And could it be argued that the term God is not an all-powerful being the conscience, but rather kind of more of a state of eternal bliss, an energy go between, you know, a stream of life, if you will, cycling through the planet at a constant rate, and that simply when we cease and we die, we don't necessarily, you know, what, uh, we kind of more, kind of return to the stream of life to be recycled again, you know, almost as an energy to start a new life in the world. Could it be argued that that could be possible as well? Well, there's a number of questions really that are involved here. If the arguments that I've given are sound arguments, then they lead to a transcendent personal cause of space and time. And that's incompatible with the Buddhist view of reality, which holds that this force is ultimately impersonal and uh, that the universe is eternal in the past. Moreover, I think the doctrine of reincarnation, the idea that we're constantly recycled, is incompatible with the, the resurrection of Jesus. If you were to ask me why we believe in reincarnation, it would be on the basis of Jesus' resurrection. It shows that one doesn't come back to lead a new life again. Rather, the doctrine of the resurrection teaches that we will someday be judged for the life that we have lived in this body and that we're not going to get recycled in that way. So while those views are, are possible, I, I don't see any evidence for them. And the kinds of arguments that I shared tonight leads me to think that those views are not true. Well, it's true that what's happening recently, uh, as they're, uh, in, in the U.S., as people have been moving away from uh, traditional Christianity, they haven't all been moving to uh, atheism, unfortunately. Young people have been pretty much uh, moving away from Christianity, but they're moving, at least half of them are moving to atheism, and the other half are moving uh, to a more of a kind of thing called spirituality. And uh, I know that quantum mechanics again comes in in the, in, the, uh, in the claims that people make that we make our own reality based on quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics shows we're part of some cosmic consciousness and so on. And that's, uh, again, there's, that's a whole different subject that I write a lot about. Uh, and uh, there's no basis uh, uh, to assume that uh, there is some kind of cosmic consciousness out there. But incidentally, the other thing to point out is that uh, Eastern philosophy does have a different view of the afterlife than uh, uh, we have in, in Christianity and in Judaism and in, in Islam. And that is, uh, in the Eastern view, the soul does not go to heaven as an individual soul, but gets, gets uh, uh, suffused throughout all the other, uh, the other souls. So there's a fundamental difference in the, in the two. Next question. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Singer, how can you uh, validate the truthfulness of any statement if you're basing the idea of truth just upon a materialistic worldview? That is, if you say that 
the things that we're speaking, the things that we believe is true, are only the, the bosses of the, you know, the chemical imbalances or the chemical balances in our head, the virus and neurons. How can you trust that that, how, can, how is that a basis for truth in the world? Is it, I mean, if that's all that's going on, isn't, aren't we just programmed to say what we're saying? Well, uh, we have this materialistic view. And I, I do not uh, claim that if you find evidence, I'm not, I'm not close to all possible evidence that, uh, that might uh, refute that view. I'm, uh, scientists uh, will be perfectly happy to find evidence uh, for a spiritual component of life, let's say. Because think of all the, all the wonderful uh, funding that would become available. Uh, for, uh, there's nothing more important than research science uh, funding. So uh, everybody would jump on the bad wagon if that happened. The only, the only problem is we have to be, we have to be good scientists, and good scientists have to go where the, the data go. And, and uh, the data so far are perfectly consistent with a purely material universe. I think you've raised a really good question that presses very hard on the materialists. Namely, if we are just matter in motion, just electrochemical machines, then everything we think is determined by our stimuli and our genetic makeup. And in that case, why well, think that your views are true? Because they're just determined. They're like a tree growing a branch or a tooth having a toothache. And there's no reason to think anything that you believe is true. Indeed, there's no reason to think the materialism is true. So that it becomes a self-defeating view. Similarly, on materialism, everything that we believe, our cognitive faculties, are selected by evolution for survival value, not for truth. And so our beliefs that we hold today are held because they help us to survive. And that may be quite incidental to their being true. So that you can't really know our naturalism or materialism that anything you believe is true, including naturalism itself. So this is really a very, very naughty problem for the materialist or the naturalist. It's not a question of truth. It's a question of what fits the data, what agrees with the data. We have a model and it works. If that's the difference between science. Science, we don't accept science on the basis of faith the way you accept uh, uh, belief in God on the, on the basis of faith, you accept science because it works. It's a, it's a model of, of the universe that so far has, has, has done the job for us. But, but you're not an anti-realist, are you, Vic? I mean, you believe that galaxies exist, for example. Don't you think that's true? Not just that it works? Well, the galaxies are part of the model we built to describe reality. Now, I agree that they, they probably come close to what exists out there in reality, but we don't, when we get down to the subatomic level, there's all kinds of different theories that, shoot, that uh, describe the same phenomena, and uh, ultimately we really don't know what's behind the observations that we make. It's a phenomenal world of observations, and there's something behind that. Now, you would say that there's the, uh, there, there's the uh, spiritual world, uh, World of well, I'd say there's a physical world, too. I mean, I'm a, I'm a realist when it comes to science. I think that it's really true that dinosaurs once walked the Earth. It's true that galaxies exist uh, and things of that sort, not just that these work. There, there, there are truths about the world that science apprehends. Well, that's, I'm not denying that, but I'm saying that when you put the whole story together uh, with science, there are many aspects of it that that you can't uh, state with that kind of, uh, of certainty. The way you can with the dinosaurs and with the, and with the moon uh, being really uh, some sphere out there to a good approximation. So uh, uh, if there, are, there are things at the fundamental level that, that we can't uh, pin down with that kind of precision. Unfortunately, we only have a few minutes left in the debate. It's been a wonderful debate tonight. We have to ask our last question of the evening. I'm sorry, folks who have been waiting in line. Just the nature of the debate. Everybody wants to ask a question. I'm sorry we have a limited time tonight. So this will be our last question of the night. Dr. Craig, there's been a number of books written on near-death experiences. I think there was a lady named Betty Eadie, an American woman who had a near-death experience. She lived in Washington. 
I wondered if you cared to comment on um, the uh, fact of near death experiences that people have. I, I'm sorry, in a sense, this is the last question because. I, my answer is no, I, I don't care to comment on that. It's not an area of expertise for me or an area of interest. I haven't looked into it. Uh, I know Vic Snickers done some work on that, but I have nothing uh, to contribute to that particular topic. Sorry. Yes, well, I have looked into that a lot recently because there's been these books that have appeared in my area that I always work on is, is where claims are made in science that uh, there's evidence for something beyond what we uh, we already uh, know, and I'm very interested in that kind of claim. Now, there's definitely uh, uh, the near-death experiences is a real phenomenon. People do have these experiences, and they come back in many cases changed. And there's a large number of people working on near-death experiences uh, that they've been collecting data for 30 years. There's a there's, they have a journal of their own, uh, the Journal of Near-Death Studies. And if you look at the popular books on the subject, there's tons of popular books on the subject all claiming uh, evidence for an afterlife. Uh, but when you look at the actual published results in, in, the, in the Journal of Near-Death Studies, which is a, is a respectable journal, uh, the experts in the field, and most of the people who work in this field, really like to prove that there's something beyond uh, the, uh, that these people are, are uh, experiencing. But that just hasn't been anything we, uh, anybody can just come back from uh, such an experience with, with information that they could not have known that could have uh, proven the, uh, they, that they really did uh, visit the afterlife. So uh, among the experts, uh, no one is willing to say that they have good evidence yet that Thank you. Uh, there's an afterlife from those experiences. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Victor Stanger and William Lane Craig. If you're interested in joining the Socratic Club, please see our table in the back door. Once again, thank you and please come to our next one.